I wish my parents had told me that as a young kid. They said, hey, when you grow up, just find a way to leave the place, you know, better than, than when you showed up. I always heard that about going to the park. But I never heard that about being a human. And so uh, that's my goal. That's my focus. What's up, guys? Today's guest is a tricking legend and one of the original members of the Colorado tricking community. Please welcome to the Jamcast, Mr. Nick Vale. What's up, man? Hey, Travis. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being on. Man, this is uh, super awesome. You're one of the people I've wanted to have on for uh, so long and for a multitude of reasons. But really in 2021, I want to focus on showcasing a lot of guys that were like instrumental in pushing the sport to where it is right now. So thanks for making the time. Yeah, this is going to be good. Super stoked, man. And it, uh, it's kind of it's kind of crazy to see how life changes. And obviously, uh, I want to delve into your tricking career and stuff. But I do have to congratulate you. I know you are recently engaged. And that's uh, a huge milestone in life, man. So my hat's off to you and the fiance. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's surreal to uh, look back on times where, uh, you know, we're all just like young single dudes tricking at gatherings side by side to see guys like yourself or, you know, Danny Graham with a family and two kids now. It's so surreal. Yeah, I uh, I was watching Dan Perez's cast and uh, his podcast. And yeah, he's got a kid that's like, I remember young Dan and now it's now it's dad Dan. You know? <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I guess he always kind of was. But, yeah, he was he was always the professor. Now he's just like a professor and a father, I guess. So. That's wild, man. And so where are you uh, Where are you speaking to us from? Are you still up in Colorado or where do you call home these days? I am still in Colorado. Yeah, I'm in the south side of Denver. Oh, amazing, dude. My sister actually lives out there. So I, I try to frequent oh. there as often as possible. And that's half the reason why I went to a Trick Different Quattro where I actually got to see you uh, at the yeah. Pike Peaks gathering. Yeah, yeah. I was I was going to say, I, uh, I feel like you're out here more than I would expect. Yeah. So there, that must be why. Yeah, it's to visit the baby sister. She has a new kid too, so it's like, you know, all these life changes oh, and stuff. Yeah, so now I'm an uncle, so, you yeah. know. Yeah, I was going to say, is that what's how's uncle life? Is that good? It's, it's, it's better than being dad life because she tells me she doesn't sleep too often. So I get all the perks oh. of the baby, uh, but then I get right. to, like, give them away and let her deal with it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best man and I think one of the coolest things about that weekend was uh you know for anyone that got to go to trick different quattro it, it was an amazing event Luis runs great events but uh one of the highlights for me man was uh on the night show uh right in the middle of the battles you went out there and threw some combos and you got rushed oh, right. by everyone on the floor and it was really cool to like feel like a, a throwback type of moment yeah that felt good I uh hadn't done tricks in a long time and um, as I, as I told you that, you know, I, I got done with what I was doing a little early. Yeah. And so being able to get there and, and see what also just to see what the community turned into, you know, I had, I really hadn't had a lot of time off at that point. And so I, I, I mean, I saw people that I hadn't seen in a long time and then I also saw people I've never seen before. And then, and so for them to like, um, to, for me to meet them and them to meet me, it, it was like, it was like reaching back in time a little bit and. Um, it was, it was cool. It was a really good time. Super awesome, man. Yeah. It's great to see it. It's kind of surreal because, you know, I feel like we grew up in a generation of watching like quote unquote old school guys. And, uh, right. for a lot of these kids now, like our generation is now the old school guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's total passing of the guard, man. So, uh, um, with that being said though, man, um, I I'm really stoked to have you on for a multitude of reasons. I know a lot of the uh, triggers from our generation are going to enjoy hearing your story, but a lot of the newer ones too, I think they need to be exposed to guys like you. Uh, so taking it back all the way, man. Uh, when did you officially first start tricking and how did you get introduced to the sport? Uh, I started in January of 2005. I, um, I did sport karate, uh, locally initially. I was, um, I'd go to tournaments with my, um, my dojo and we would, uh, I'd spar a lot, but we'd always go and watch our guys do creative forms. And I, I thought that was really cool. And this guy, Charlie Keller, Locals may know, maybe they'll know Luis knows Charlie for sure. <laughs> Luis knows Charlie. Uh, he did like a double leg, I want to say. Okay. And then, uh, and I, I'd never seen anything like that. And it, I mean, I'd done like gymnastics and stuff, but I, you go over the side. Yeah. That was cool. And so he, I, I asked my instructor if like we could bring him in to do a workshop, want to learn some more things. And, um, you know, I had a ton of questions for him like the next week. And he pointed me to Steve Tarada. 
it was game over. That's all I needed. Everyone started with Steve Tirada in our generation, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah he's, he's the man, yeah. you know? The first one. That's crazy. And so was your initial I mean, exposure just, just watching his videos? Or what was it that actually like turned you into a, getting inspired to actually try these moves, I guess? So twofold. Uh, I think, well, to to be inspired, it was really just that moment, like realizing that I could, I could kind of do what I wanted yeah. with a flip. And, um, but when I, my instructor at the time was not so hot on tricks. They, they were, um, really invested in the traditional forms and I was good at traditional forms and I started doing more time on creative and extreme forms and that created a rift. And so I, uh, I ended up just going to open gym and like, like watching bylang videos at open gym. And then I realized I could just do tricks and I didn't have to do the forms and deal with my instructor at the time. And so I think I always wanted to go back to martial arts and I did later, but, um, yeah, open gym with bylang and, and, uh, like Steve and, um, Calvin Sulka and, you know, these guys, Steven Rennie, uh, you know, that, that really did it. I, I remember it being a blur after that, you know, it was almost like weeks and then it was just a blur. And then I was tricking. <laughs> and in those initial sessions where you're, you know, at these open gyms and stuff, are you training predominantly alone just uh, based off the inspiration of these samplers? Or did you have like a small training group at all? No, it was, it was just me. Yeah. Hardcore, man. I think that's something that a lot of people don't experience these days because of how prevalent tricking and parkour gyms are and just, you know, how widespread it is that a lot of us back in the day literally were just crashing solo and the inspiration to train alone is very difficult for some. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that was a lot of the the early years was just crashing alone, <laughs> you know, in a dojo and like landing, uh, you know, on your side on a B-twist or something like that. Yeah. Oh God, B-twist. I think for a long time, that's why uh, there was such a draw towards the Luke Kicks camps and the gatherings because sure. there was such a huge community where you could actually be surrounded by other trickers. And uh, and it's so surreal to hear you talk about training alone because obviously we'll get into it a little bit later. But, you know, Colorado has, for lack of a better term, become one of the new meccas of tricking as far as having a, a, a size of a community and stuff like that. So uh, in those early years, though, when you were tricking and stuff like that, um, like how many days a week were you going to these open gyms and, uh, you know, were your parents supportive of this at first? Uh, okay. So I, um, so I, I would go to the dojo while there was not a rift between my instructor and I for like, like I would, I would leave school early and drive down the hill cause I lived in the mountains. I was a mountain person. Okay. Um, and I'd drive down into the town and, uh, I'd, I'd wait for the dojo to open five days a week. Um, and then open gym on Saturday and then grass tricks on Sunday. I just I never rested. I was 15, 16 years old. You know, you can do that at that age. Um, but then I, I had to, once I stopped going to the dojo, I had to outsource and find gyms throughout the state. So I started building this list of gyms that I could go to. Um, and my parents were pretty supportive as long as I was, uh, you know, as long as I was not getting into trouble and as long as I was not, um, you know, going to work, do, you know, if I was not going to be in school at the time, I needed to be like working and that kind of just doing something uh, other than just tricking, then they were fine with it. Um, you know, and I joined the army. And uh, so I, I did a lot of other things uh, at the same time, as long as I was doing that, they were good with it. Um, but once I started branching out to other gyms, that's when I ran into people. Uh, there were other people that were solo training in each. There's like maybe one person per like three gyms yeah. that was training solo. Totally. If you just go to enough of them, it's like flipping over cards. Occasionally you find a king or something. And I found John Neese. I found Eric Benjamin. I found uh, Dan Perez. I knew him from the tournaments, but I, you know, he was, he was almost like this master Roshi in the Hills guy. It was, he was hard <laughs> to find. He was up at 5280. I had to like journey to him. And he likes the solo training. Just so so he does. <laughs> yeah. He was, he's ahead of the game in that respect <laughs> so man that is wild man and then obviously those are the guys that you uh got to train with or you know locally start to form you know yeah. training sessions with was there anyone on a larger scale that you were continuing to watch besides steve Torada at the time or anyone that was inspiring your style or were you developing your own style just through exploration i was a big fan of anise Mm -hmm. and uh he had the same body type as me and what what caught me was everybody that i was watching was kind of smaller yeah. and i'm a bigger guy um i 
I don't know. It's probably not. I've I've been told that like me on video doesn't um, doesn't feel like me in person. I, I feel bigger in person is what I've been told. So um, I got that feel from my niece when I watched his videos. His, his tricks were bigger, and I like he had long legs like I did. You know, he had to work harder to get into the air, and and for that reason, he seemed to jump higher. And like that's how I felt. And so I watched him and. Then I watched a lot of Danny. I like got into this Danny phase where only kicks were tricking, you know. <laughs> and then I got into this uh, Jeremy phase where only transitions and like trying to take an easier thing and, and slap it onto a harder thing was like how I tricked. So I don't know. I just kind of went through phases uh, where I tried to like emulate the violang samplers that I saw, and I would just like again there was a Kelman Solka phase. That's where I learned to aerial twist and like mm-hmm. Webster and stuff was was that phase. So. Um, I don't know. I, I played chameleon for a while, I guess. Rudy called it playing ditto. You just go and try and ditto every person that you you know you watched, and so uh, that was the, that was I think how I developed my base, you know, because everyone brought something different. Danny brought the kicks, Anise brought uh, cork slips, twists, and like kicks in the in the twists, and like everybody just brought something different and that built my foundation until I met Dan. Ah, and what was it about Dan that changed things? Dan was the first person that saw that he like saw the matrix in a way back then. And I had seen like bits of it here and there, and I just didn't know how to like articulate it. And I think it makes sense what I'm doing now, given how I I started training, like I do physics and like astronomy and and astrophysics and math and stuff now. And back then I was looking at tricks in the same way. It should, tricks should be coherent. It should be logical. Uh, You should be able to, to take off of any foot in any sequence, in any direction. And Dan saw this and he put words to it. Even better, he put words to it. And so I was able to like just soak it in and, and, and fill in the things that I didn't quite, I didn't quite have words for, but I I could see it in my head. And I I knew what I, what I was like, I knew that you could take off for a raise off of any, or either of your feet. You take off a raise in many different like angles. I'd seen Jeremy do this angle. I saw Anise do this angle. I saw Danny do this angle. Like, why couldn't we do all of them? Why couldn't we do every transition into raise? And Dan answered those questions for me. So Dan just, uh, yeah, he was like, it was like finding a tome. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've been searching for so long, and I found, I found it. You know, so that was that was a good time. That I got, I got a lot of like pulled hamstrings and calves because I couldn't <laughs> stop training because there was just so much to do now. That is wild. And and are you a fan of true kick terminology as far as a, a, a structured system of being able to verbally explain uh, rotational and degrees of axis and stuff like that? Yeah, I just, okay, so yes. Okay. Short answer, yes. Okay. Uh, longer answer, um, I so I just, I actually talked to Charlie a little while about this. Charlie, uh, Charlie Greenheart or which... Greenheart, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, Charlie, it's not not Charlie Keller, yeah, yeah Charlie Greenheart, Charlie Green. um, and I was saying I, uh, you know, I'm like I can build, I can like like build the math around tricking now. I can tell you like where center mass is. I can tell you what's happening in like inertial tensors when trickers are twisting and turning. I, I can do the physics now, and TKT is what describes tricking like math describes physics like it is true to the physical reality of what's happening if you set your definitions you just set your definitions at you know i count i count in like front side or backside stance that's where i I choose to count from and then i choose to do 180 rotation on the ground in like kick transition and boom it all follows it's all like logically follows and so yeah if if i got a pump tkt for dan here like uh if you want to know how to like teach yourself tricks, learn TKT. Okay. For sure. I I agree with that. We we let Dan run uh, his program at Jam as a flagship tester for like 3 years when he first launched. Uh and dude, I saw kids come in that literally walked off the street, couldn't do anything. And in a year they're putting together combos that none of us at Open Gym could do just cuz we skipped so many steps along the way, you know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. It's- Correct. He, he had little kids doing certain moves, which, you know, to the naked eye probably doesn't seem difficult, but to like, you know, hyper jackknife, for example, is a rarity for some reason. It's a super rare one. And he's, yeah, unbel- why? 
I don't know why. I, for a long time, I even asked Guthrie if he could do it. And he's like, nah, it's a weird one to me. And then he figured it out eventually. But yeah, I think just the hip rotation, like Donovan Sheehan had one of the best ones back in the day, personally. Yeah, his was legit. Yeah. Full yeah. full second uh, hyper on his on his second yeah. kick into turbo landing. It was crazy. So <laughs> Yeah, it's wild, man. But it's good to hear, though, that, uh, that Dan was an influence on you, too. I feel like he's one of the most overlooked uh, people within the tricking community as far as his contributions to the sport. So... Yeah, he's he's to tricking what Isaac Newton was to classical physics. That is crazy. And to, to hear from someone like yourself like that, which we'll get into later with what you're doing nowadays, I'm sure that's insane. Um, yeah, he's, he's the man. So you're taking it back to like uh, your early days in tricking. I know you started in 2005, uh, but it wasn't until like 2007 where you started like releasing videos on your YouTube channel, uh, like Bilang Sampler uh, and stuff like that. What was it that finally made you feel like you were ready to start releasing footage to the world? Was it like a personal comfortability or was it just like YouTube was finally getting prevalent at that time? Like what actually got you to start putting yourself out there? Uh, Dan said that I should do it. <gasps> Dude, Dan. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> Dan, Dan, yeah, Dan got me into it. Like Dan got me into tricking, you know, all these other things inspired me, but Dan got me into tricking, you know, so I, I found TT through him. Yes. So, and that, and once you like start posting on TT and you start talking to people and getting a dialogue going on, then footage just starts flowing, and that's that's really what did it. And, so. that, and that's how you know you're old school, Nick, because you know what TT is, you know what TrickSession.com is, you know what Biling is. <laughs> I okay, so I was at I was at the Open Gym session where Trick Session came into being. No I remember it. Way. Yeah, we're sitting, we're sitting, Eric Benjamin is at Lily Gulch okay. with um, this guy, Mike. He doesn't trick anymore. I, I don't even know what happened to Mike, but Mike was there. And um, we were talking about how Juji had kind of stepped away from TT. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was like this big issue, right? Uh, there was no, there's no place to go. And Eric is, I mean, he worked at, he most recently worked at Google. He's like a coder. Ah, sick. And yeah, and so... Um, he, he's like, let me just put something together real quick. And he like overnight put this thing together. And the next day I came in cause we were going to play, I think like Halo three or something at his house Okay. and like way back. And, um, and he's like, yo, look at this. And he like posted it and he's like, go get me content, go see if you can get some people there. And we, we did. And then trick session happened. Cool. I don't know what happened to it, but I remember it, it was like, man, it happened in like, like a flash in the pan. It happened so fast. That is wild. Yeah, I know. I, I, I miss a lot of the things like that. Dude, I, I do miss TT forums sometimes. Like, you know, I miss the by lane going to one dedicated spot. But, uh, For sure. you know, we, we are spoiled with the amount of saturated uh, media we have these days. Um, yeah, we did it. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah, we man. Did it. We did. And I think one of the other things that can really, uh, you know, distinguish someone between being new school and old school is if they know about this one event that happened back in the days. And I've always wanted to ask you this, so I'm so glad I can now. Um, and for those that are old school, they're going to know about this right away, but I've always wanted to know, uh, were you there for the art MD versus Danny Graham battle or how did you have that footage? Cause I know a version is uploaded on your channel. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, no, I was not there personally. Okay. Um, I had, I think I had just been in Florida. Ah, so I yes. think I had just stayed with Danny for a while and, um, uh, and I remember, I remember like the beef really getting, getting like drummed up, like right after that, I think. And then, um, I was talking to Danny on uh, MSN messenger, I want to say, okay. and he was talking about the battle and he's like, Oh, I just, I wrecked him. And he's, he's saying all this, he's just like talking his game. Right. And then he sent me the footage and I was like, yo, I'm going to make this into a sampler. Is that cool? And he's like, yeah, yeah, do it. <laughs> so, so out it came you know no way i've always wanted to know how that was on your channel and and it's funny because right before that video there are uh sessions of you down at hurricane so i was just like i was just curious if you were actually there to witness it yeah no i wish i was uh, and there's there was the footage that i put out was like a small amount of the footage ah. um so uh yeah, there was like there's there's like hidden footage somewhere on my well, like my externals that maybe someday we'll we'll find. But it's like Danny talking, and there's like a it's like it's like forbidden footage. That, you know, I don't dare reopen it. That you know? is crazy. <laughs> it's, his thought, it's his thoughts on the beef. 
you know and it's so i I almost want to just like let it be lost to the pages of history i don't remember what it was to be completely honest i just remember aubrey being like danny be nice (laughs) (laughs) that's so good man he was like no (laughs) oh that is so funny man well, that's crazy, man. Yeah, I just I always had to ask you about that. And now around a, around that time is kind of like, um, you know, when you really started leveling up, I feel like was really between the years of like 2007 to like 2010. Now, obviously, you've always had incremental gains and stuff like that. But I think between those years is when you landed like your first dub and then getting all the way to like your first dub dub. And it was between those times where you were just really killing it, putting out tons of different footage, you know, triple fulls also were along uh, along that timeline and stuff like that. Uh, so what was it that got you to continue to like push the boundaries, I guess, as far as, you know, incremental twisting? Because back then it wasn't something that was as widespread as now. Yeah, um, I think um, I had seen. So, you know, at that point we were Dan and I had, I think, thoroughly cataloged uh, a lot of like, like rap kicks and, um, you know, a lot of the cheat kicks, a lot of like vanish kicks and like vanishes from weird setups. And, um, I know Dan actually had like, I don't remember what Dan was doing at this point, but I I had kind of moved on. I was like training with Ed and some of these other, I think Aeroform had disbanded, but I remember distinctly leaving that time frame, understanding that like kicking could be broken down in this like very sequential, almost matrix like fashion. Yeah. And um, where you could like take a, a, a takeoff, choose a rotation and then tack on an ending. And you could just like create a kick. And I remember talking with Ed that, you know, we should be able to do this with twisting too. There's no reason why twisting should be, in, the only difference is the axis you're rotating on. You have a non-zero flip, right? Mm-hmm. When you're When you're doing like, vert kicking you just have a zero flip but it's the same thing as like a cork like a box cutter Mm -hmm. is the same thing as like some cheat kicks if you just choose to like orient you know your your frame of reference that way and so uh you know we started it was then ed and i started just like on a whiteboard just like writing down what do you do how do we do this and how do we break it apart and then we'd see like this was the biggest the biggest like validation of what we were doing is i remember seeing jeremy do like court delay twist i want to say mm-hmm. and it was like mm-hmm. like we'd never seen it before yeah. but we had it on the board and so we're you like, knew it was in the realm, realm of possibilities yeah and there it is it was, it was just proof of concept we were like oh my god all of this stuff we just need to find a way to do it it exists right it's there the technique is there but we just haven't seen it yet or we're calling it something wrong or we're approaching it wrong and this is where i had such an issue with calling like a cheat 720 round cheat 900 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because of this and like you're you're calling it something that's it's like calling hydrogen carbon like you're calling it the wrong thing on the grid and so it's also telling me the wrong takeoff and the wrong rotation and the wrong variation to use so um and i i felt the same way about the twisting and the flipping this is why i i had a difference in my mind between corking you know having like under 45 degree Mm -hmm. uh, inversion and gainer full, like corking and gainer full are two very distinct things to me. And I was like, I remember just like pounding the drum online for this, where I was just like, guys, do do the the delineation. And then at the same time, the same people would ask me like, how do you do this? I'm like, I'm, I'm effing telling you, you know, like (laughs) you just don't, you just want to give up the name, you know, like, so, um, this was, uh, I think, yeah, it was, it was just like, honestly, I just remember that whiteboard to be completely honest <laughs> from that whiteboard we had, uh, Ed and I, um, and it was a, it was a very short lived thing. I don't know if he remembers that, but I remember watching, um, Velu's sampler, mm-hmm. uh, homeless. I want to say, and he did B twist, uh, vanish 720 round, like hook something up. And, and he, he does this combo that goes through. And I was like, my God, his flipping and his kicking and his twisting are all completely uninhibited. And, and we just like did this, this really fast, like thing on the, on the whiteboard and I took a picture of it and I remember it just like living for a week or two and then and it was gone and we started working on it. So that is wild to hear about, man. And, and it's so surreal to hear like how small the tricking community is in full circle. Like, uh, I, I'm, I'm at my house right now and, uh, Ed Bossert, who you're referring to, is 30 feet away in my guest house. Like he lives. Oh in, no! Ed lives in my backyard, man. It's crazy. Oh, Ed's a G. Yeah, cool. such a I saw his like getting hit by the um, 
the golf cart thing. Yeah, that TV show. Yeah, yeah. I saw a couple of episodes like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's so That's crazy. So cool. Yeah. yeah. He's out there doing it. That's really cool. Yeah, super small world though, man. It's it's pretty surreal that he's out here. Um, and so, dude, that that makes a lot of sense as far as you guys, uh, categorically, or I guess you know, breaking it down, trying to go after move by move and stuff like that. Um, it's it's so insane to me just because you know this generation now is spoiled in a lot of ways in the sense that they just got to see everything that's actually possible in front of them instead of having to think about it. Um, yeah. was, was there a certain move that was the most difficult for you to achieve during that time or one that was just like giving you the most difficulty as far as figuring it out since it was so new? Um, snap round. Oh, which is a hard one, dog. So that makes sense. <laughs> Which is a hard one, right? Like, it's not even just like hard conceptually. It's also it's a, physically difficult. This is a hard one, yeah. Because most yeah. times you want to just get your feet down and land, you know? Right. So, what, yeah, snap it around for sure. And I spent a lot of time doing like the, I don't remember what, what we called it, but you do like a butterfly, round kick, and then twist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I don't know what it's called, though. But. Yeah. So, I, I spent a lot of time doing that and then also doing, um, raise twist like raise up twist down and try and land on only my left leg and like be willing to sell the farm willing to die to not touch my right leg <laughs> and i never actually got it um not good anyways i did like a like a really bad like 45 one but yeah it's kind of a unicorn one that got away crazy man that is so crazy and now one question i've always wanted to ask you man because this was something that i saw in all of your videos back in the early days was how were you able to train in socks all the time <laughs> <laughs> um okay so originally i had okay so this is a fun story i guess i don't know i i originally like was at a halloween session i remember and i was doing like this was right before I had this like moment of insight um, in December, uh, the big boy session. That was like, that was wild. So it was like before that um, I had kicked the floor really hard mm. and uh, like blew my toenail off. Okay. Okay. And so I had to trick in socks so that I wasn't bleeding everywhere, like for months yes. after that. And then, so it, it kind of like almost was a joke. And then I realized if the floor wasn't chalked, it was really slippery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, if my balance was off, I would fall. Ah. But if my balance wasn't off, I had a more maximal power, right? So like balance is part of the principles of power. If you've ever talked to Ed Bosser, you know that, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the so socks made it so that my dynamic point of balance was never off. Okay. And so... Um, it was like weighted training after that. And so then I, I really started to feel a little weird. I started to like catch my toes on the ground if I didn't wear socks. Crazy. So uh, yeah, and it, it let me like rotate on, the, I could pull my toes up like this and rotate on the ground and then bring them back down and grab. And so I could do things like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the Viking sweep where you do yeah. like an inside sweep, jump up and then like pivot. And yeah. you can pivot to like a B twist or something. Yeah, yeah. That was a sock thing at first, and oh, then I figured man. out the technique to do it. So where you like you jump over like that. So, um, yeah, it started from an injury, but it turned into a training tool. Cool. Actually, I still wear socks all the time, and they never match. <laughs> I, I did notice that too. Sometimes that's that's wild, man. Did you ever get to try uh, Danny Ekins' uh, tricks wear socks? No. Okay. I I, I think. We started like product defying socks after I left. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, is, good? Uh, I, I personally never tried them, but it's just funny because uh, he was on uh, the episode that came out last week and we actually talked about it. Yeah. And so, yeah, oh. just just kind of full circle that we're talking about socks and tricking right now. So I just had yeah. to ask you how you always did it. Um, and it's funny. I remember that big boy session that you're talking about. That was a uh, really dope uh, sampler that was kind of surreal because I feel like the description said something like, like it was almost like the session was over something. You just went hard for like 30 minutes or something. And that's where it was like your first clean triple cork where you're landing with your chest up as opposed to like chest down. Uh, and what was it about that day that just clicked? Like, do you remember? Uh, so yeah. Um, 
I think um, Brett DeRus, yes. which is uh, you know, one of the DeRus brothers, yes, right? Yes. He um, he lived in Colorado at that time, and he's easily one of the best training partners that I've ever had. He's like, he's kind of like Ed in the same way that like it matters to him that he trains right, mm. you know, and and Brett was um, Brett was like. A, like how Ed was of the Dan and me variety. Yeah. Um, Brett was of the Guthrie variety. Oh. Okay. And so he brought a different like layer to the sessions. Okay. And one of the sessions that he brings from Guthrie is the like, uh, I start by destroying the session. Trick Ooh, one. Ooh, okay. You know, trick one. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. destroy everything. You know, we break the spring floor with the, and we, we burn it, we like blow everyone's hair back, right? And that's like, that's how Brett trained. He'd like walk in and he'd like kind of stretch and he'd like stretch and he'd be like, snap it, you know? And so, um, so that session, I feel like I had finally learned how to do that. Cause I was a slow warm up. You know, I did the Dan thing. I'd do some kicks and I'd do some jogging and then I'd do some like stretching and stuff. And, but I figured out how to, uh, do that. And then we left actually. Mm-hmm. We left the session and then we came back and that's when the big boy session came happened no way yeah because we left and like you know i, I kind of got like a second wind i'm gonna do that and then like we went back and it was like 30 minutes and it was like pivot dub dub and it was like um snap into stuff and like i was like wow this is crazy wow. <laughs> so is but I, I credit brett for that brett brett really like brought that out of me okay that is super crazy, man. I've always, always been curious about that. And now one thing I always want, I always want to ask you too, is just like, as far as training in Colorado goes and stuff like that, did you have any, uh, differences in your training seasonally? I guess tricking is more of an indoor sport. So you've always got to be inside, but I ask that just simply because like when I talk to guys in the parkour scene, for example, there's a long period of time where they don't train just because of the weather, the cold, you know, the environment and stuff like that. So were you able to train pretty much year round despite the conditions? Okay. Yeah, and you know we get a lot of snow up here, and so you know even when the snow gets bad, we typically have open gym and stuff. So okay. it's hard to, and we all have like Jeeps and yeah. Subarus and stuff. So uh, you know it's it's a rarity that you can't get to the gym. So yeah, pretty much. Okay. okay. And now uh, just along the lines of like obviously getting to that level where you're landing, you know the dub dubs, the trips and stuff like that. One of the other things that you also got to do back in the day was go to a bunch of gatherings, you got to battle at a bunch of events and things like that. Um, was that something that you enjoyed as far as battling was concerned? Or were you more of a person that was just into the training aspect of it? I, yeah, I, I saw battling as like um, uh, something that I owed the community. Okay. Not something that I really wanted to do. I always, I always think of um, tricking as like being a ciphering thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I also understood that, like in the early days, we battled to get attention yeah. for tricking, yeah. and um, it was like a little bit of like a, a nod to break dancing, some of the roots, I think, yeah. uh, you know. And then um, I would go and battle at events because it brought spectators, and I often was being flown out, and so I, I owed, I felt like I owed the community and I owed the event. I, I felt like I actually owed the event a lot, and I felt like that was something that I, I particularly brought that when I was going out as a guest, I owed them a battle. I owed them uh, a workshop. I owed them uh, private lessons for free donated to the event for some of their locals. Like I owed them things because they were doing all the work for the community. They were the ones putting it all on. I was just showing up. I did all the work in training, you know? And so battling was in that set of things that, um, you know, I owed, I owed the community because they gifted me with, um, you know, the ability to fly out, you know, watching the tricks that I did, wanting to be there, paying to go to the event. So, um, but no, I, I no, I didn't like battling. Ah, man, that's wild. And it's really crazy that you mentioned that and, and, and not to bring up Danny again, but, uh, I actually, when I, when I talked to Danny Etkin in his episode, he actually, uh, literally brought up the fact that he remembered back at a dreadnought gathering where you took him aside and gave him a free private for an hour. Yeah. And it's just really crazy to hear that because I feel like that's something that doesn't always happen these days. There's almost, you know, and and this isn't to put any, uh, you know, discredit or any beef on the guys that are, you know, quote unquote, like the celebs are tricking right now. But I do feel like, you know, um, obviously everyone says tricking is cool because you can go to an event and you can talk to anyone. 
But I do feel like sometimes there is a disconnect between, you know, maybe some of the high level trickers and kids that are just starting off and stuff like that. So yeah. it's pretty cool to hear that you had an influence on someone like a young Danny Ekin back in the day, you know? Yeah, that's cool to hear, actually, that he remembers that too. Yeah. So I had, that was the, um, yeah, wild. Crazy, right, to think? Yeah, yeah, I'm just like playing the, yeah, the memories there. Thinking of him as a little kid, and now he's a, he goes to USC as a college student. It's just surreal. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was just seeing like him at uh, Five Star, I think was the gym, and on yeah. Long Island, and yeah. there's, a, there's a, a session I remember, like, he's always been good, but I remember watching him being like, this, there's something here. Mm-hmm. This one is different, you know? Yeah. So... Um, yeah, dang. He's a, yeah, he's a grown man now. Wild. Surreal, man. It's crazy. And now along the lines of battling, man, there's one thing that I've always wanted to talk to you about because uh, okay. it was something that hit the tricking community pretty crazy back in the day, and uh, I was in the midst of it as well. And uh, what I'm referring to is the HKPK Championships held in 2012 okay. in Las Vegas. And uh, oh, yeah. for, and for anyone that knows what I'm talking about, um, it was a really cool battle. Uh, it had some, some of the... It had, Everyone back in the days, it was an event thrown together by Rory Bradder, uh, HKPK in Las Vegas, and uh, had a uh, Red Bull presence there. And it was cool because we got to see team battles, three on threes, as well as a one on one championship. And in round one, you got placed against a guy who you explained earlier watching, Mr. Anish Sherfa. And I think one of the things that surprised a lot of the tricking community was in that round one battle, you walked out as the winner over Anish. And I've just always wanted to ask you what that moment felt like. And if you remember what you were going through during that battle, whether you were ready for it, whether you're intimidated or, you know, like w- what your thoughts were surrounding that entire scenario. So, yeah, I, um, that was one of, when I think about like, uh, my tricking career, that was one of the, one of the, the better moments, not winning, but competing against him. You know, it it wasn't that, it wasn't really about winning. I I know at the time it was like really cool for me to do that, to beat, you know, somebody that I I looked up to in a battle. Um, But just to be on the same stage and be able to compete at that level and um, compete uh, in a way that makes him work. You know what I mean? It was, it rarely did you see Anise work in a battle, you know what I mean? And so he's just, was that good. And so, um, yeah, it was, the, yeah, surreal. It was, it was wild. I, you know, leading up to that, I had, um, had pneumonia and, um, I had, uh, my, my doctor said that I shouldn't compete and I was on antibiotics and, um, the day before, like, I remember being in, I remember being in, uh, seeing the doctor about a week before and him saying that like traveling with, you know, uh, my left lung actually was infected. I had an infection in my left lung. And so I, uh, he had advised me not even to travel. Um, but I said, I'm just going to do, you know, the battles that I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to be in my hotel room otherwise. And he's like, you're going to go to Vegas and be in your hotel room otherwise. And I was like, yes, actually, you may not know me, but that's something, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm going to sleep the whole time. So, uh, and I did, I, I, I remember leaving the day before early after the battle, as soon as the battles were done, I left and I went back and I fell asleep and I woke up early the next day. And, um, I, I remember not even really warming up all that much because I was afraid that I only had so many tricks left in me. And so I, I thought, I thought to myself, I had four passes in me. And so I was going to use one to warm up, three in the battle. Crazy, <laughs> crazy. And what was your what was your plan if you had gotten to the next round? <laughs> I didn't have a plan. I think that was super obvious when when I was like battling Ryan. I was like, I don't know what to do right now. I can't see. I'm dizzy. I like I can't breathe. I was just over with the paramedic. Like <laughs> I don't know, you know. So yeah, and that, that's definitely how it played out. Ryan wrecked me. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, it's crazy, man. It's just, it's a, such a surreal moment. And honestly, like it shook up the tricking world for a long time. I mean, it shook up our local community because I was one of the judges alongside Stephen Rennie and Dan Perez and uh, Dan Perez voted for Anise. Stephen and I voted for you. And uh, I think a lot of people just assumed I would automatically vote for Anise because he was one of my best friends at the time. And um, 
you were calling balls and strikes. Yeah, I was. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Balls and strikes. Yeah, yeah. and that, and that's the thing is that like uh, at the root of it, one thing I always tell people because back in the day, you know, uh, it was a huge, huge controversy in the forums and and stuff like that. People were just shocked. And I think one of the things I always told people at the time was that uh, you know, you obviously should just analyze the tricks from a very you know uh, like an analytical standpoint. But I remember being in that room and in that battle. The first pass was was you did a pass, he did a pass, but then you answered back really quick with your second pass. And I just remember the room just kind of shifted and I was like, Oh shit, what is happening right now? I was like, I hit him with uh-oh. the dub gainer dub. Yeah, you hit him with the gainer dub, and I was like, uh oh, uh oh, what's gonna happen? And then I was like, Okay, Anise will have an answer for this. And it was one of the first times ever he fell on a combo. Like he literally did not land his combo. And uh, I think for a lot of people, if you look at that and you look at the way that he kind of was a little bit off, it's very similar to the way that a lot of people looked at the Andrew Franklin versus Michael Guthrie battle in Trickstar, where Andrew Franklin just did his normal stuff. And honestly, I think what happened was Guthrie fell for like one of the first times ever. And it just, you know, super unusual ways, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I remember watching, like you're saying, I remember watching the Andrew and Michael battle and being a part of the audience that time. Yeah. And just being like, like almost watching the the Super Bowl come back against the Falcons, just like did this happened, yeah. you know. And and it's not that like I didn't think that Andrew could do it. It's that I just didn't expect that from Mike, yeah. you know. And and for good reason. Mike typically lands everything he does. Yes. So you know. So. <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know. A, a clock is. I don't know. It's yeah. It, He's like a clock. Mike's like a clock. You yes. know, it's just like sometimes like it's a little off. Yeah. I don't know. Just randomly. Just randomly. Yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. No, I just I just always had to ask you like what that moment was like for you because I just remember that uh it was a unique moment in tricking and obviously I was involved, you're involved and stuff yeah. like that. And uh it's just a cool part of tricking history, I guess, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was that was wild. <laughs> um, oh man, that's cool. And now, uh, you know, one thing that I do want to talk about, and uh, I don't mean to bring up a sore subject, so we can stay on this as little or as much as you want to talk about. Um, but I think that what was crazy was around that time, like obviously you were, you know, one of the big figures in tricking and obviously contributing a ton of the sport. And I think it was, uh, you'll have to tell me the exact date, but I do know that you sustained a major knee injury. Uh, or I guess, leg, yeah, we can talk. let's say leg injury, because for those that don't know, it was a laundry list of injuries, you know, um, and, and I'm not the expert on it. So, uh, I know there was something with your LCL, PCL, uh, something with your calf, your hamstring. Like, you, can you explain to people what exactly happened on that box cutter attempt and what, what you were left with? Yeah. Um, so I, I still haven't shown the video Yes. because I, and I, I still maintain that if I show the video, I think it's harder for trickers to get, uh, insurance. Ah, okay. Okay. So, um, it was just a, like a cinematic angle, wow. you know what I mean? Of like a really bad injury. Yeah. And so I, what happened was I, so I was frustrated about something outside of the session and in the middle of that box cutter, I was feeling like another trick, but I hadn't like taken off like that. You know, I didn't take off to do a second trick, but I felt it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to swing rays out of this. And I, I landed halfway in between where my foot should have been. And so my knee went that way. Crazy. And so, yeah, well, actually, it went that way. And so, okay. um, so we went to the outside. Um, I had, so I tore my FCL, which is your LCL. Uh, I tore my PCL. Um, I tore my popliteal tendon and ligament. <laughs> Um, I broke my tibia and fibula, the top part of the, t- the fibula popped off and my hamstring came off with it. Um, my MCL had a partial tear. My ACL still is partially torn, um, from it. I tore the meniscus on the inside and on the outside in a spiral fashion, um, on the inside meniscus. And then, um, in the immediate moments afterwards, uh, we were worried about my life. Wow. Holy crap, yeah. man. And not to, not to, you know, bring up like obviously something that was super tough to deal with, but I remember watching an interview that you did actually with P 
Pete Rulon Miller back in the days. Yeah, people. Yeah, and it was really what was really surreal to me about that interview when you talked to him about it was that uh, the perspective that you had about your injury was probably one of the most positive perspectives that I had ever heard anyone talk about because a lot of us get into you know I've had three surgeries myself. Um, I remember watching a niece have his first knee surgery. Um, you get into these really, really dark moments um, where yeah. you feel like your entire life is stopped because your whole life revolves around training and, um, and you feel just alone, you know, for the first time in forever. And I think watching that interview, which shocked me so much was just like the positivity you had surrounding what you were going to learn from it and the way that you were going to be able to expound your knowledge of the human body and physical therapy to other triggers and uh, I think that was one of the coolest things that helped motivate myself when I eventually had my knee surgeries as well and stuff was uh, just like looking back and being like, you know, something good can come of this. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm happy that like that helped in your surgery. Yeah. Surgery's hard. Yeah. It's, uh, you know? it's, a, it's a unique thing that not everyone has to deal with in this lifetime. You know, uh, we're in a rare 1% that actually I feel like uses our bodies to the limits. You know, the average neighbor across the street of mine probably walks his dog and goes to the gym to lift weights, you know? <laughs> like, right, yeah. <laughs> so it's surreal to see, what, like, what we do with our bodies and stuff like that. Um, and so, like, after you sustain, like, such an, a major injury like that when you're, you know, for lack of a better term, like, at the top of your own tricking career, uh, how long was the recovery process on that? And was it mostly physical or mental that you had to deal with? Uh, I mean... The recovery process is different based on physical or mental. Um, so mentally, uh, I don't think I ever will stop recovering from it, wow. you know? So, uh, but physically, I, let's see, I didn't walk. I didn't walk for, oh, I don't know, months even. No way. And then, yeah, and then I, uh, I, f I remember like, so I remember, I remember getting, having my surgery and then some other guy came into PT at the same time as me having an ACL surgery. He was doing box jumps like four months later and I still hadn't started walking. That's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So, cause my doctor told me, he said that, you know, he's never seen, um, this combination of injury. Yeah. Um, and, uh, because typically you don't have injuries like this. Um, and he wasn't sure if I was ever going to walk again. You know, he said like the, what I got from it, he said, you know, uh, you can, we can just lash this thing down and you know, you'll have a leg and you'll probably never be an athlete again. Or we can do some stuff that like we're still learning about. We we just put together some like new procedures and and you can choose to do that, but the recovery's on you and it's gonna take a lot longer. And I said, um, what happens if I don't succeed? And he said, Well then you go back to just not being an athlete, you might might not have a lot of function in your leg, you may even decide to just like amputate if you want, because that was what was on the table before Holy when God. I went to the first doctor which was our um, lacrosse, our professional lacrosse team. Yeah. He said, you know, I, I would just amputate this. I wouldn't work on it. So that's when he sent me to the guy that I went to and he's like a guru. Um, and I did some, I did regenerative surgery and I did, um, but ultimately to answer your question, it was uh, about 18 to 20 months before I felt like I was uh pre-injury without a brace on okay just standing just standing yeah like yeah. upright not being not as an athlete just standing upright felt normal after about 20 20 months 18 20 months something like that almost two years that is wild man that is yeah. super wild and did but that... what he did was br oh sorry go oh on. no 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 go for it yeah explain explain yeah. it man because i know it's a super yeah. unique process yeah yeah, what he did was brilliant. So what he did was he took two tendons of cadavers and he like wound them together to form, um, like if you took a PCL and you modeled it, uh, it would look very similar to this these two tendons that were wound together. Okay. 
And so he, he like nailed that into my leg and he, he repaired all the other stuff pretty much like typically, but what he, I don't know the exact process of what he did to this thing. Right. But somehow uh, my body tried to heal this PCL as if it was, it's like native tissue, its own tissue. And then, and so it built a new ligament around this tendon or this, this implant. I I think it's a tendon. I'm not a doctor, you know, but he, what the implant that he put in, it built like, a new ligament around that then the ligament in the middle dissolved and a new blood system flowed through there and so i regenerated my pcl it's my pcl crazy yeah because obviously the the goal the one of the goals of it is to get blood flow for healing right stuff yeah Yeah, okay and so what he said was he said you know we you know you don't come back from this so what we have to do is is we have to try and get your body to heal itself essentially um, and we have to trick it into healing it. And so what that means though, is you have to mimic injury, o- almost the stress of an injury. You have to mimic that. So your body thinks something's wrong and it's trying to heal a ligament. Crazy. So it was 18 months of inducing the same pain that you get from injuries. Just to get your body to do auto response of healing. To heal. Yeah. Holy so, so it was, it was on me and whatever I ate, that's what, that's what it built it out of. So I had to have a perfect diet and I had to work out and I, I, I didn't spend any time outside of the gym. I focused on, I learned how to eat right, learned how to sleep right. I learned how to recover, you know, I learned how to deal with trauma, like emotional and mental trauma from it. It was truly transformative. That is wild. I would absolutely go through it again. Wow. That is, that is crazy to think about. Cause I do remember that time when you really were like really focused upon clean eating and weightlifting and being in the gym all the time. And it's crazy that it took something like almost devastating in order to bring you to that, you know, next level, I guess, as far as uh, having a full understanding of your body. Yeah, it was, and it was a blessing, you know, really, because not because of what it did for me, but immediately afterwards, we started the tribe. I was just going to ask about that. I was perfect segue, Nick. (laughs) Keep going, brother. Keep going. Don't even let me interrupt. (laughs) Perfect, doc. Perfect segue. (laughs) So, yeah, we, um, we met, uh, you know, Ed and I had decided that we were going to go different ways. Yeah, and, after elevation tricking. Yeah, 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 and you know that was that was probably the best thing for both of us. I mean, looking back, for sure, it was the best thing for both of us. I mean, look at him now; he's super successful. Yeah. You know, and Seriously. I'm I'm super successful. It's great. You yeah. know, we're, we're successful in what we're doing. It's the best thing. And so, you know, Charlie and I started working on Tribe, and uh, we took that same approach of. Um, uh, what I learned in in my recovery, what helped me get through it emotionally and mentally, which was like relying on my support system. Yeah. Um, and then combining it with properly training your body to be a tricking athlete, okay. which is what I had to do in recovery. Yeah, and so totally. what we did then was we, we started young trickers, new people that had never seen tricking before with TKT basics. So we filled in all their technique and their theory. And then we, we, showed them how to eat right and build their bodies up and stay balanced and roll and stay, you know, don't let overuse injuries give you a hip flexor or a hip pointer or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then take you out, you know, your best avail- availability and tricking is your, or your best ability is your availability. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, but the key component that I think that we, that we added this time was the emotional, mental and uh, group support okay. that, you know, you should rely on your friends. You should rely on your, um, the triggers around you, you should use them as um, uh, like springboards of growth. And that is like the thing that made what we were doing before different uh, from tribe, for sure. Okay. That is crazy, man. And obviously, it kind of laid the ground roots for what the Colorado scene has become now. Because I feel like before, obviously, you guys had, you know, Air Forum to ET. Uh, but you know, the try was kind of like the groundworks for what I guess has become, you know, people relocating themselves to Colorado to be surrounded by a supportive community. Like you're saying. Yeah. Super crazy. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not like at sessions now. I, I sometimes, you know, I'm around, um, and it's, yeah, it's like, uh, it's like a gathering every day, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's hard to find a session to train alone. Yeah. 
<laughs> which is funny. It full circle to where we started, where you are only could trade alone. Uh, um, right. That's, that's really cool, man. And I think one of the other things that was always cool to me was not only seeing your influence upon, uh, you know, fellow members of the tribe in the Colorado scene, but specifically seeing uh, the way that your little brother went from a kid that didn't train and would just show up at sessions to actually dedicating some time into, you know, his physical appearance as well as tricking uh, was just really cool to see, like, you know, your younger brother, like, kind of step in and start making a name for himself back in the days. Yeah, he, um, you should see him now. Oh, my God. I haven't seen him he in so jacked. long. I haven't seen him in so long, dude. <laughs> Years. Nobody's seen him. Years. You know, he's he Years. just, like, he went into, his hair is, like, down to here. He's, like, I mean, holy cow, is that kid jacked. Like, um, unignorably large, actually. Yeah. No you way. would never expect that lanky little, you know, little kid with those long limbs doing box cutters and like legs all over the place. You'd never expect being this blocky, just super jacked Spanish speaking no. salsa dancer now. <laughs> <laughs> How times have changed. <laughs> How times have changed. <laughs> oh, that is so crazy, man. Um, that, that's awesome, man. Yeah, you have to send my best to him. And now uh, along the lines of stuff like that, um, obviously, like, you, you just mentioned that you're not as involved in sessions uh, as you were in the past and stuff like that. Uh, at what point did you make the decision to kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, direct your focus towards other things, I guess, as opposed to just tricking all the time? Um, you know, I, I had, I've talked to a number of people about this and I don't really know. It's hard to like pinpoint a single time, okay. but it was apparent to me over looking at like, some things over time that I, you know, the community had outgrown what I had to offer locally and even abroad. I had a different vision for tricking. And, and I think that when I was pushing tricking, when I was first kind of a leader, that's what tricking needed. And uh, I felt like it was moving in a direction that was not in alignment with what I had to offer. Okay. And so I was running into where, you know, I just, I wasn't enjoying it as much. And I could see that other people had like ideas. I, I just couldn't really think about like, I just didn't hadn't the younger people had ideas that I, I just didn't, didn't occur to me. And I was like, my God, that's a good idea, you know? <laughs> and so it, it, it just, I needed to move on for the sake of me and for the sake of tricking, you know, it was, it was obvious when things were not quite right. You know, you, I think all of us noticed that, you know, when you have like frustration with people that you typically don't and, you know, you don't have like innovative ideas and you're, you're finding more problems than solutions. It's just, it's time to change something. And that's what I found. And, uh, I think it was the right call because look at it now, you know, like I was, I don't know. I was just listening, just listening to like the wind, you know, yeah. just listening. When is it time to move on? And, and the situation just kind of told me. That's crazy, so, man. Yeah. I met somebody that helps, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, totally. But I think that is a, is a sign of maturity as well because, you know, uh, it could go both ways. It could go where you leave on your own terms and your own accord, or you could be that guy that's just like, you know, hanging on to living in the past and, and trying to just still thrive off of those, you know, things from 10 years ago. So, no, I, I think that's cool to see the progression that each of us have, you know. I had uh, Ot on here uh, a couple of months ago, and it's crazy to see, you know, someone – that was like him and now he has a job like working at the local libraries and he has a he has a, a kid you know it's like it's uh it's so surreal to see that everyone has these chapters in their lives and for some of us we're we're just on a different chapter right now you know like um and, and that's all that matters and so what is your main focus these days uh i know it's a lot more mentally uh involved as opposed to physically in some regards but uh, can you just let the audience know like what you're up to these, these days, days? Yeah, so I am a full-time student in CU's uh, astrophysics program. Um, I study both philosophy and astrophysics. I have um, associate's degrees in mathematics and physics. And so my early days of education were focused on doing um, aerospace research. So I was doing suborbital rocket launches, looking at um, ways to deorbit space debris. Um, there's a, there's a, a really bad problem called the Kessler problem. Okay. It's like apocalyptic and we don't have time to really probably go into it, but um, it's like, it's kind of like the space climate change. Uh, you know, it can cause our satellite networks to go down, that kind of thing. And so deorbiting space debris is really important. And so I spent a lot of time, probably two years of my academic career working on that. And then um, I did, uh, see at the end of my, my physics path, I did um, 
we made a particle detector so you get um muons that are particles from space that come down and they make tracks and detectors and we built a detector and so that was really fun um but now i'm focused on uh mostly just a general and broad rigorous scientific training um because i think i'm gonna end up in uh studying law okay. and i think the effects of scientific illiteracy in law and in attorneys and in our government and in society have been really put on display the last like year. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that the problems that we're going to be dealing with when I have kids, the problems I'm going to care about are going to be described by science okay. and better science is not going to do anything. You know, if we already describe these problems really well, and that's what science does. It just describes things, just describes the physical world, but the real battle is going to be in the courtroom in the legal area. And I'm going to feel like, I'm going to feel like I'm not doing anything and I've got kids that are at danger of some existential crisis if I'm not like working on a problem and, and in the trenches that that's going to be lawyers. And so, um, unfortunately astrophysics has allowed me to pretty much interpret any, uh, science that's thrown at me for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so there are some disasters that are as bad as COVID waiting in the wings. And it would be really nice to have a more scientifically literate, electorate and attorney population um elected people advising elected officials it, it will be very very nice later on when you know, i can use my mind like i used my body in tricking you know oh, so that is um, wild. yeah super wild and now obviously like you, you kind of mentioned it before how you have an understanding of physics so much better now would your younger self have benefited from the knowledge that you have now if you had coincided it with your tricking training back in the days? I might have killed myself on that box cutter <laughs> if I knew what I knew now. Like, really? I might have actually died. Really? Um, yeah, I... Uh, um, there are... Trickers may make use of momentum conservation in a really, really um, unique and elegant way. And a lot of the technique that we hear, things like eagling... Yes. Yeah, and lifting, these are all things that are very, very well defined in physics. And the physics of them can be augmented based on technique. Well, I'm sorry, you can augment your technique to make use of the physics, yes, right? Yes, physics yes. works for everybody, it's just maybe it doesn't help us, you know? And yeah. so you can absolutely use some of this to help the technique. Like if I knew, so there are some things regarding like, so the universe seeks lower energy. It seeks um, places of equilibrium. And there is a place of equilibrium in uh, between an inverted and a horizontal flip. Oh. So like your B twist and your, your gainer full. And that's that 45 axis that we see. It's like, it's a little under that actually. Okay. And if you can hit that, you can drill, you can drill at a completely different rate. Of, and, and you see some people like those early triple corks, yes. when we, the people that could do it and we couldn't figure out why, well, they're hitting this like natural like area that um, the, the physics is more confusing than, than clarifying, but it hits uh, a situation that is way more advantageous for us to flip. And that's to do with our mass and where our inertia is. And then also going from a very large shape into a very small shape. I think all of us know that that's super useful, right? Yeah. But you can also augment it by making yourself more cylindrical this way. Not just this way, but also like that. Yeah, yeah. And so when you drill, round your shoulders, push your push your, your like spine back, shoulders forward, and hollow out between uh, your neck and your hips this way. And you make this really strange shape that flips and twists insanely fast. And that's like Guthrie hits that naturally. Velu hit that naturally. I went back and looked. Some of these people like Chose is literally built that way. If you actually stand, if you watch him stand, he's, he stands in that position. So like his natural form is better than most of ours. So yes, uh, physics, if, okay. So young trickers that are mathematically inclined, if you want an advantage, study physics. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. If you want, uh, it, but a little bit of physics is very dangerous. So be careful. <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> cause you don't know enough to know when you're wrong. Yeah. And true. when you're wrong in physics, you know, things blow up like your knee or whatever. So, um, yeah, actually there's a really great audio. If I can just plug it, my professor yeah. at CU has an audio book, um, on, uh, what is it on audible? The great ideas of classical physics His names, uh, Stephen Pollock. He's like the MVP of yeah. physics education. And I made Charlie listen to that twice. And he said it was game changing. 
and it's just an audio book. It's concepts. You don't need math. Anyone that's into acrobatics should watch that or I'm sorry, listen to it. It's truly amazing. And he gets into like, into the weeds about it. Like you actually learn some stuff. So crazy. Um, well, yo, all you yeah. trickers go back three minutes and listen to the entire thing that he just explained guys <laughs> in regards to the shape you're supposed to hit and the audio book. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Hit me up if you want to know more. Man, that's uh, crazy. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to help. I wish that I knew some of this stuff. Yeah, totally. And now you kind of just uh, answered my question by uh, mentioning that you saw the way that Shose stands and the shapes yeah. he hits. Uh, but my question is, how up to date are you with the current community? Do you still find yourself watching stuff and, and being up to date with who's who? Or how, how, how are you as far as, you know, your tricking knowledge in 2021? Uh, I follow the homies. Um, you know, like I support the people that um, I knew and you know, when, when I see some crazy stuff, I usually repost it, but you know, I, I couldn't tell you, like, I couldn't tell you about those nuanced, uh, discussions about like between who's three and four and, and, uh, and yeah. why three is not two. And you know what I mean? Like I couldn't help there. Um, I just know that Shosei is killing it and he's Shosei is doing some things that in 2012, I had a tumbling instructor who was incidentally also a physicist, um, he was telling me that the future of acrobatics is uh, power tumbling with our transitions mm -hmm. and our, our axes. He was saying this back in 2012. He's just like, just, just watch, just watch young man. Like people are going to be doing four falls, which meaning like double, double doubles, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, like double twisting, double backs off of one leg and wrapping into him and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, probably. And now we're seeing, yeah, like wrap, wrap pull in type stuff. And, um, and Shose is also slowing down before he lands and so that uh, adds the possibility of like his knees and everything like getting to where he could probably swing out of it into another double flip and there's nothing in the physics prohibiting this nothing at all because he's slowing down his rotation right before he lands and so no i don't know a lot about the tricking community but i do know that he's onto something okay so That's good to know uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming it's coming i'm telling you when you see that from his double flip where he's really fast in the beginning he slows yes. down and it's almost like yeah, so all he needs to do is he just needs to figure out how to make that muscle memory, and then he'll turn it into a setup like a gainer switch. And then it's everything that he does out of a touchdown raise or anything else will now come out of that double flip. Okay. Um, every time. Crazy. I'm calling it right now. What's the time stamp? Yeah, what's, what's the time stamp? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 2021, you heard it here first, guys, on the Jamcast. And now from someone that has like an understanding of mathematics and physics in the human body, um, I'm very curious on your answer to this, and maybe you don't have an answer, which would be interesting too. Uh, do you think there are actually any limits to the maximum capacity or maximum number of twists that trickers will be able to hit? And I only ask this because there was like a, a video article that came out last year where it's like, why is it almost impossible to do quint cork and stuff like that? It's yeah, it's definitely not almost impossible to do quint cork. Okay, um, so, so yeah, it's very possible to do quint cork. Um, so the what I want, I don't, okay, so what I wonder is I wonder if the human body can take the training leading up to quit court. But at the same time, it, yeah. like, okay. let's just, for, for you know, the sake of, of this, let's just assume that a body did. So we just have this body that survived this training, and it's fine. Um, I think that it would take uh, a specific frame and shape okay. um, to do that. I think, um, kind of like how the NFL, you know? Yes. Not anybody can play in the NFL. You have to be touched by the hand of God. You yep. have to win the biological lottery. And I think that we're looking for people like that, um, the Simone Biles of yes. the world. And maybe it's like Chose. Maybe, you know, it was Guthrie and it was Valu and it was some of these guys. It was Anise. You know, there's there's one every generation. Um, but no, I don't think um, I don't think Quint is impossible. And I think that there may be even really abstract body forms and weights and like someone with maybe like insanely heavy legs and really light upper body but super wide shoulders might be able to do more or something like that um but we're starting to get into where like biology matters yes you know and so um but there yeah there are physical limits i mean i would i think it would be difficult to go past like six or get to get to six twists probably Okay, that was my oh, question. Yeah. Without like the aid of of like a apparatus, like a tramp or something, you know, or okay. a spring floor. But um, yeah, I mean, my God, yeah. There's for every body type, there exists a perfect uh, technique that they can do uniquely. You know what I mean? And so we're just looking for 
for every trick, there's a perfect body type. So we're just looking for the reverse of that. And so we're just looking for that body type. Okay. Um, that also, again, survives it. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I'm, I'm ve- I was very curious to hear your answer about that, but it's cool to hear that you think that it is possible and that six may be one of the difficult levels to push through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah, no, four, um, uh, who was it that was just recently doing a uh, quad cork that I saw? Uh, that a... was slowing down before they landed. Yeah. I think it, as soon as you see that, you start looking for another half. Okay, yeah. And I mean, and have you seen Chose's Quint Full? Uh, no. It was, it was very easy. It, it was, was insanely easy to the point where I was like, oh, well, goddamn, maybe six is possible, you know? Well, yeah, so like, that's, and that's what we did with like round off and touchdown raise was we said, okay, how do we get the exact same amount of energy and flip and speed and stuff out of a touchdown raise that we yes. do out of a round off? And then we figured it out. Yeah. And so now we're just waiting for that. So maybe it's not even in the court technique, you know, maybe it's in the touchdown raise, maybe it's in the master scoop. That's really, maybe we're getting into a place where you have to power up your touchdown raise to do this. So like really what you need is you need like an aerial swing touchdown raise mm. to power up. To get the momentum. To quick cork. Yeah. You know, to make your touchdown race to you know, look like a round off, feel like, and, and operate exactly as a round off would. Okay. So, um, yeah, and, and maybe now we're going to start laughing about this looking back where we're like, ha, 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 is it possible? Yeah, well, we never considered using other things to power up your setups. You're you know? right. So, like, <laughs> you know, there's a whole generation of tricks that are going to come from something like that. Maybe that's where we get the, the double flip swing through out of, is we get it out of something that powers up. Your touchdown raise so that the 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 double flip is not the hard part the hard part is controlling the double flip okay that's the hard part right and and that's you know so maybe we're going to get into something like that i think and there's nothing in the physics that prohibits that nothing at all crazy i don't know if the mind moves that fast but maybe who knows <laughs> you never know you never know what's one thing that shocked me was um when we had a uh, show come to the jam gathering 2019 uh, when he was there, he did triple B twist, swing through gainer, cart quad full. Uh, and it was the first triple B twist swing through uh, in the world. Um, and what was crazy was at the time, we had a long discussion with Shose on the jam cast. And then we had an off air discussion with his coach. And they actually said that at the time, he was behind their schedule of moves he was supposed to have landed according to like their goals for him. And I'm thinking like, what in the hell are the goals that they have for this kid if he's already behind and breaking this stuff, but maybe it is. I want to know who his coach is. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah, his name is Taichi Okada. Um, he was a tricker himself. You know, I mean, he could do, you know, the doubles, double fo- double folds, double corks. He would do triple corks into the pit and stuff. But he's just developed this, I don't know his actual training technique, but dude, they had a gym that got so big and so full of kids that they had to expand to a secondary gym now which is so big that it has like two sides and they even have like a battle arena that they set up with lights and do fake battles in house and stuff. And it's like, wow, he's clearly got something going on because he has Shose and he has Zen Kajihara. I don't know if you've seen Zen Kajihara. Yeah. I've seen Zen, but he's good. You know, Zen's doing, you know, he's sure he's doing, you know, shuriken, which is, you know, cork shuriken box cutter with a triple kick. He did four kicks now. Oh wow. He's doing four. Oh wow. Four kicks, bro. I just throw another one in there. Yeah, he's doing another one in there. And I'm like, how is this all happening at the same gym from these same little Japanese kids? But I wonder if it has to do with body size like you kind of spoke about as well as some technique there. These guys in in Japan, they've, so they've got, you said Zen? Yeah, Shose and, they've and got Zen. Shose. And they all train at the same gym. And there's even some other like little kids. I mean, they had... They'll just post like a random kid on their story. It's like, hey, 10-year-old does triple full today. I'm like, what in the hell is happening in Japan right now? Like, Hmm. You said that they, they've got like these really wild goals. Yeah, apparently. This, the, like they see the future almost. Yeah. And, and, I, be done. and I also wonder if it has to do with, you know, and not to make it a racial thing or, or a societal thing, but I also wonder if it has to do with their work ethic, you know? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Japanese people are known for just putting their heads down. And, you know, I just... Yeah. I'm just very curious as to what is happening in the waters in Japan right now. Because I'm sure if you remember back when we were tricking, there wasn't even a scene in Japan, right? If there was, I didn't know about it, you know? Yeah. Um, Same as like China. And I mean, we always knew that, like, I mean, we'd always seen like the Korean demo teams, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think you're right. I mean, if it's, they must have something in the scheme. Yeah. 
you know, the way they're scheming up training, the way that they're, they're looking at it. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe it is, maybe it is a cultural thing. I mean, look at, I mean, I, I think looking like at an American made, like antique rifle versus uh, a Japanese made antique sword. I think the craftsmanship is like super obvious True. that there's like a, you True know, story. like a societal <laughs> difference there, you know, like cowboy <laughs> taking a lot of cavalier liberties and like shit that blows up in your face. And then you got this elegant weapon. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, you know what I wonder though, is I wonder if, I wonder if there's like a, like a Brady Belichick type pairing where, you know, Shosei would have been good, Zen would have been good, and you said Taka, Taka. Uh, tai, tai Chi, Tai Chi. Tai Chi. Tai Chi Okada, yeah. Yes, yeah. not him. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a tricker. Um, <laughs> so Tai Chi uh, would have probably been really good independent of this situation, mm-hmm. but you get the right pairing, right? Like, I think of like maybe me and Dan or like, uh, yeah, like these guys are great now, uh, Ethan Turner and everybody that he works with, you know, like it's just – the right pairing, you know, maybe that's what we're looking at is we're looking at the right mind with the right body type. And, and then also, uh, a family situation and a gym situation that's conducive. I mean, we see, we see the thing, you know, what Velu's doing and Velu's pumping people out. And yes. I mean, yeah. as far as I can tell, there's no show say over there, but it's a matter of time, you know, give Velu time, <laughs> like, yeah. let him work his plan and, and we'll find some. So, um, yeah, that's actually an interesting thought. I mean, what happens when the guys like us do what you did, right? Where you say, I see this need in the community and I see a way to fix it. So I'm going to put together something like White Lotus that turned into jam and, um, you know, and Bellu's doing this and we're seeing these gyms pop up, right? Uh, we kind of tried to do it here in Colorado, but it was too early. You know, insurance really was not a thing. And again, it was just not the right time, right? Yeah, yep, totally. Um, but yeah, when we start seeing these minds that were good minds, also good trickers, but good minds and good coaches and good people, uh, getting a hold of like us when we were younger, like if you had you when you were younger, like what, right. what kind of tricker would you be? Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, so same kind of thing. Like if I had me when I was younger, so maybe that's what, maybe that's what, Tai Chi is, is Tai Chi is so, uh, Shosei and Zen, but just from a different timeline. Totally. You know, in this timeline, he's a coach. That's crazy to think about. I never thought of it that way, but you're right on a lot of levels. So I bet, I bet what's going on in Japan is going to be the, um, the rule, not the exception 10 years from now. You know, I think every country, every scene is going to have something like that. Okay. So, Imagine that. Crazy, Crazy, right? (laughs) (laughs) Crazy. Uh, And this is something I've never done before, man. But uh, I want to I want to do this just because I want to get your perspective on it and see if it's changed at all and kind of just lead into what advice you would have for trickers these days, knowing what you know. Uh, And this is a quote of yours from back in 2011. And it's uh, it was part of a long, long post that you put up, but it was something that I always remembered. So I even went back and pulled it up just so I could read this one paragraph. And and I want everyone to remember that this is 2011. So your numbers that you're referring to as far as like the tricking group size is like half the size it was now. Uh, oh, population. was I throwing out like philosophy? I was, yeah. I was thinking and posting, huh? Yeah. yeah. So, so this, this is, is a cool, cool one. one. Yeah. Right, I'll just, just give me a few seconds to read it here. And so uh, this is the first time we've ever quoted someone. So here we go, guys. It says, the guys who are quote unquote famous in our little 8,000 person after school club got there by doing what was fun and what was a blast to go do. Please, guys, please fill your tricks. I want to see what your passion for this brings, not what moves you can do. I don't care what moves you can do, and anyone whose opinion matters isn't going to care what you do. They just want to see you trick, and I want to see you do something, anything. Remember why you started tricking, because it was cool as fuck, right? Well, you're already in the top 8,000 people in the world, so why try and climb to the top of that out of six and a half, uh, 6.5 billion people in the world? You're already in the top 8,000, so just do your thing and do it because it's fun. And I just remembered that because it really hit home to me because it was something cool that you're saying was there's all this drama and there's all these beefs and all this inner competition within the community. But when you really look at it, we're less than a 1% in the world already. And so why make it a competition amongst a small community? 
the battle is really from within yourself. And so I just wanted to, to see what your perspective was on that. And if you had any advice for, you know, trickers of this generation based on all the knowledge and experience that you had over the years. Um, well, I, uh, that was a good thought, younger me. <laughs> 2011. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think the, you know, the human race is going to always grow faster than the rate of people into tricking. So we'll always be unique like that, you know? Um, and so I think that that will always stand true. Everybody might know about tricking, but very few people actually take that, that step. And so, you know, well, yeah, if you are tricking, you are doing something super unique and you're doing something that, um, it's likely that people will come and go, entire families will come and go and no one will ever experience what you just did, you know, like on the floor. It, it, personally, they'll never experience like landing a new trick and, and like feeling that from everybody in the room is like genuinely stoked for you, yeah. you know? Um, so it's, yeah, live in that actually, because you're right. There is so much drama outside of tricking and inside of tricking. Like we saw caught, so you know we get caught up. Because I think I don't know if you felt this way, but I always felt unique because I was a tricker. I always felt like I was in kind of an in club, and um, and it mattered what people thought in tricking about me because these were people I looked up to. You know, they were my peers, and and so yeah, it's easy to get caught up in in what you think other people think about you. But now, having spent all this time away from tricking, people are not happy for your success in the real world, just a priori, right out the gate. You know, they're not happy that you were successful. You know, often life is viewed out as a zero-sum game, for better or worse. And in tricking, it's not. Tricking is one of the few places that it's not a zero-sum game, where you can succeed and it doesn't take anything away from anyone else. And so it may not mean, it may not feel like a lot, but being on the other side of it, I didn't appreciate what we had. You know, I didn't appreciate the amount of acceptance that I had and that people that would just love me for who I was and quirks and otherwise, you know? Um, you almost have to hide that from the, from the rest of the world at times to make sure that you're like looking good at a job and like, you know, that kind of thing. But tricking was, I was just watching tribe samplers before this to like pull back some memories and, and there was a video of uh Grady and um uh Kerwood and Bryce Decora and uh some of these guys were on a road trip and we were just talking and um Aiden Kennedy or not Aiden Kennedy Aiden from Colorado was playing Kendama in like in the oh, back yeah, of the yeah, car yeah. and yeah, yeah yeah and you know it was like Grady talking about music uh Bryce, who's like an aerospace engineer at the time, um, there was Saul yes. from uh, Mexico was in there, and yep. he was he was talking with somebody, and they were trying to like get through the language barrier, and, and I, it just struck me as like there's not not a single person in this car is even from the same area, you know, the same ethnicity, same culture. I'm sure all these conversations happen at, at gatherings, and but you know, it's it's not we are more divided outside of tricking than we are inside of tricking. And so it felt, it was like a shock when I went out into the world and, and people weren't just stoked to be doing the thing they're doing. Like I'm, I'm showing up to algebra class day one, I'm fucking stoked. And nobody else is stoked to be doing algebra. I'm like, what is this? Is this? You know, but I've been like so in, in, inundated and in tricking that like everything you do is fun. Like, why don't we have a good time? We have to train anyways, you know? And so, just live in it because the rest of the world is not that way right out right out the gate you know so tricking is a special thing what special time. place these are special people i think that's great advice man that's super good advice especially in, in relation to the real world out there because a lot of us especially at the age where tricking is most prevalent in most kids lives you don't have responsibilities uh you're probably not working uh, towards a career at that point you you really are focused on tricking and it's a it's cool to hear a perspective from someone like yourself who has uh, been a part of the community, stepped away from it to pursue, you know, higher education and, uh, you know, obviously still like has a, a insight and perspective that's valuable. And so with that being said, like, when was the last time you trained 
And do you ever think you'll train again, even if it's just random sessions for fun? Um, I don't know the last time I trained to like get better at tricks like years ago, okay. but there are moments where I do tricks. I don't, a year doesn't go by where I don't do tricks, you know? Okay. okay. So, um, I, you know, I did a combo this summer and pulled a muscle, uh, <laughs> And, you know, I'll go to a gathering and do some inside sweeps, you know, so uh, <laughs> um, I think, uh, though, Alec has got me in much better shape now. My okay. brother is like keeping me healthy, making sure that I'm taking care of me, you know, uh, I got to have a six pack up here and here, you know, so um, he's reminding me about here. Uh, and so I think I... There may be some, like, if anything, I would just go back and hang out. Ah, okay. I think I, um, I miss doing tricks so much that I think that if I were to, the feeling of doing tricks, right? Like landing a trick being a, and just being like in it, you know, being in the flow at a session. I, I think that if I started doing tricks in the condition that I'm in now, which I'm in a much, much better condition than I used to be, uh, you know, after I was just an academic for like two years straight, um, I would feel that I could still trick and I would probably start tricking again. Okay. So I'm going to save me from me yes. and, uh, you know, I'll probably just go and hang out at the session. Um, you know, one cork leads to two. It's like a potato chip. You know, you can't just do one trick. Yeah, you can't yeah, just yeah. eat one potato chip. Yeah. yeah. Don't take the, don't take the dog off the leash, you know, just keep them on. You know? Yeah, no. Cause <laughs> I'll, I'll blink and it'll be three months later and I'm like working on dub dub again, you know? And like, yeah. I have forgotten to do my homework or whatever. You know? So <laughs> plus, I'll be honest that, you know, I was talking to my partner about this, Vanessa, that, um, I, you know, the, the brain space that I had for like air awareness and timing and that kind of thing, it's taken up by other stuff now. Uh, and, um, you know, all that stuff is so atrophied. I feel like if I, I, I can, yeah. Like, so what I did over the summer, I did like cork pop flash, some kick and then a touchdown race flash kick. And that was like extraneous on my body. Like, you know, that I, I put uh, effort out to do that and I was a little lost in the cork, you know? So, but I was back. I, I like, it snapped back by the kick, by the third trick. I was like, boom, I know right where I'm at. <laughs> but like right, right away that first cork, I was like, uh, huh? You know? So, um, yeah, I'm going to save me from me for sure. Crazy. crazy just go hang out with uh just go hang out with the boys and, and the girls and you know see what the young kids are doing and you know i feel you i'm uh, i'm kind of getting to that point right now myself i'm in that i'm in that weird stage of denial where i'm a few years older than you so i'm trying to hang on to the last few years that my knees have but the problem is is that i'm training with guys like bailey Payne who are like barely in their 20s and uh i just find myself yeah, exactly. He, I mean, he has softball ankles his entire life. He can roll his ankle and he's fine. But uh, I find myself like training out here with these young guys and uh, I get more injured at a higher rate of frequency for a number of reasons. And uh, yeah, I may have to make that decision too, like you, just to like hang it up on our own accord and uh, just simply to protect ourselves. You, uh, you just had a knee injury, didn't you? Yeah, end of last year, I uh, tore my MCL and fractured my tibia uh, tibia capsule. Ow. Yeah. Was that the jump? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. On yeah. the white box? Yep. And what was crazy yeah, was... Yeah, I remember seeing that. I was supposed to, after that, the next day, we were supposed to drive to Denver and spend three days in Denver. And I was going to hit you up then to interview you, but we never even made the trip, so... <laughs> Dang. Dang. But you're, you're good, though? You're good now? Uh, so here's the funny thing about that. So uh, I, I healed from the MCL, but to help my tibia fracture heal, they put a heel wedge in my shoe to offload my weight of my foot. Uh, and so it's like, it's, it's like thick just to like offload the position of your foot. And I went and trained parkour with Bailey after having not trained outside for months because of the knee injury. And I landed flat foot and forgot I had that insert inside my heel. So I almost fractured my heel because I landed on this rock hard wedge in my foot. And that was three weeks ago. So I'm limping still, luckily no fracture, but like an insane heel deep bone bruise. So. Dang. Yeah. I, uh. I'm glad that your MCL healed. Yeah. I'm sorry that you got a tangential injury there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm also, I, I dropped a telescope in my foot the other day. And so I've got a, <laughs> I've got a, <laughs> of course, right. I've got a, a bone bruise. that's like 
bruising through my foot right now. I think I'm on the back end of it, but um, I, I'll probably heal faster. I don't, you know, I don't have to go run around like yeah. be on camera like you do. You know? Yeah, it's rough, man. It's rough. I'm I'm in this weird uh, self preservation mode at this point in my life where uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh, make some choices soon. You know, so. some business choices. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cam Newton, Super Bowl Fifty. I feel you. Yeah, bro. Exactly. Um, exactly. Are you? Uh, you're dang. That's like an end of an era for you. It's kind of surreal to think about, man. It's uh, it's definitely been humbling in a lot of ways. You know, like yeah. the whole quote midlife crisis thing is a uh, is a reality in a lot of ways. You know, and it's not as in, in, in the way of like buying expensive things and that. It's more so the uh, the starting to realize that your physicality is not going to be there forever. And it's, yeah. it's one of the hardest things to cope with for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. Especially when like you've always relied on your body and yeah. it's part of like your, how you view yourself. And, um, I don't know about if you felt this way, but I always felt like my self-efficacy was tied to my athleticism and, yeah. you know, and that bled into other things. Like I felt like my ability to do non-physical things was impacted by how I felt about my ability to do athletic things. Just confidence in general was tied to it. And so yeah, it's you're right. It's a transition, yeah, and it's uh, not easy. It's not easy to start relying on your other, the other things that you bring. But you bring other things, though, right? So, yes, 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 you know, <laughs> you're, the tricks that you bring are not yeah. always the best thing that you have, and, totally. and that was that helped me. You know, when I was, I stopped tricking right after the injury. I stopped tricking to get better, right? Like I was just trying to trick to keep the community going and be a part of it. And I had to come to terms with um, that my tricks were not my. Uh, my contribution anymore mm -hmm. and that was okay yeah, yeah. i can bring other things you know i have other value i'm not my tricks yeah yeah, yeah. um i hope i hope you find some kind of peace with that when you inevitably do your transition because who knows you know maybe you have the brady thing going on you get like you seven eight wins you never know yeah yeah um but <laughs> <laughs> things like this like the jam cast are kind of like my i guess my slow segue into the other realm of uh taking a back seat and trying to showcase newer generations as well as you know bring out the older generations so that it doesn't get lost amongst the sauce you know so yeah Hell we yeah. would have uh we would have eaten up something like this yeah. when we were younger the jam cast you totally, know man. it's a good thing it's a good thing you're doing i appreciate it man yeah and um you know one thing that i always ask before we get out of here and i'm really curious what your answer is going to be because i feel like you've gone through a uh an arc of life whereas a lot of my guests who are young teenagers on here are still trying to figure out what they want to do in the future. Yeah. Um, so I'm very curious what your answer is going to be on this. Uh, where do you see Nick Vale uh, five years from now? And where do you see yourself 10 years from now? So five years from now, hopefully I'm done with law school um, or I found something that I feel like I can contribute in an equivalent way. Um, I am going to be getting married in about 18 months. And so um Hopefully, you know, we'll have started a family by then. Um, she's an insane woman, like not in a bad way. Sorry, I realized I came out bad. She's like an insanely great catch of a woman. There we go. I'm missing those, those middle part. Um, and uh, one of the more intelligent people I've ever met from uh, a personal standpoint, she's an educator. And so I am looking forward to in five years learning from her how to interact with a small human yes. uh, in the same way that she interacts with small humans. Um, so, uh, and then hopefully in 10 years, hopefully in 10 years, I'm, uh, uh, you know, to be completely honest, I can't, I can't tell you what's going to happen in 10 years because it's a really quick sidebar. Um, the, uh, there's like a lot of ice that's broken off from the um, polar ice caps and like yeah. a lot of our ice reserves. And so we're going to be losing shoreline in the next five to 10 years, causing mass in inland migration. And that's going to be a bigger crisis than COVID by like orders of magnitude. And so I don't know what's going to happen because that's going to happen within 10 years probably. So I hope to be on in the trenches, I guess. Okay. Because uh, water wars are coming like oil wars came and uh, people are going to get taken advantage of, uh, indigenous people, uh, regular people like you and me are going to get taken advantage of. And so hoping to be on the front lines doing that, uh, cause 
the little guy is a person too, you know, yeah. people are, you know, so yeah, I've really, um, you know, stepping aside from tricking a lot, I really have focused a lot on like, I think it, my contribution's done for the most part. It's about protecting the next generation. And, you know, science has allowed me to really describe what could happen if we don't change our habits as a civilization. And so, um, I've got a laser focus on that because that affects my kids and it's not about me. So, um, I'm not even voting for me. It's not even for me anymore. Right. Like I'm set, I'm, I'm on coast right now. Like I'm just going and I'm trying not to cause damage and I'm trying to, you know, so, uh, yeah, I'm really focused on my family, you know, my relationship being healthy and, um, trying to find a way to fit into the machine so that I can make a little bit better world than I, I showed up in. You know, I wish my parents had told me that as a young kid, they said, Hey, when you grow up, just find a way to leave the place, you know, better than, than when you showed up. I always heard that about going to the park. But I never heard that about being a human. And so, uh, that's my goal. That's my focus. Philosophy is good. Study philosophy. Hell yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, man. I think that's a super good goal. And, uh, you know, hopefully that doesn't fall on deaf ears to all our listeners out here and that, uh, everyone can kind of just take that and make it a part of their own, you know, personal lives and perspective to try to leave the world in a better place. So, yeah, no one's going to do it for us. Yeah. So we should be the change. Hell yeah, man. Now, before we get out of here, uh, real quick, uh, I'm going to ask you to shout out your socials and stuff like that, but I know that inherently along so doing so people are going to want to know the answer to this. So before I do so and get out of here real quick, can you just let the people know where the whale comes from? (laughs) <laughs> I'm in Bellu. So uh, there's um, on the the European tour. So I don't remember who is interviewing. I think it's an invincible interview. Yeah, I think so. For yeah. Bellu yeah. and uh, I think Scotty, maybe Vivian's there. Um, and Bellu says Nick Whale, and Scott says no, 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 no. That's an aquatic creature, you know. Nick Vale is a human being, and I think Bellu says something like. Like, he acts very confused. Like, that this is news to him. Yes. Wait, oh. is not a whale? So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Even even in school now, my uh, my little icon in class, when I log into class, it's a whale. No so, way. it's stuck to me. Perfect. Um, that yeah, is- sometimes from upstairs, I'll hear Mr. Wahale get up here. Like, okay. <laughs> So oh, thanks for that value. <laughs> that's amazing, man. And so along the lines of that, with that being said, can you just let people know like uh, where they can continue to follow you if they choose to and stay up to date with what you got going on? Uh, well, I'm mostly off of social media um, because often my uh, opinions are mistaken for my department's opinions. So, uh, but I'm on Facebook. You can find me on Facebook, just my name. Um, I'm very easy to find. Um, I, if you, I'm sorry, I don't have just like a list because oh, I, I, you know, I really haven't pushed social media for a while. This is, I realize it's a great opportunity for me to like, but um, yeah, I look for, uh, let's see, Instagram is the whale co at the whale co. And then uh, I don't have Twitter. Same. I don't use mine. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah if it's there, I don't use it. I don't know. It's probably there. Um, but yeah, just find me on Facebook if you want to connect. Uh, Messenger, just message me. Um, I'm always down to talk. Hell yeah, man. That's super dope, man. And, uh, you know, on behalf of myself and the community, thanks not only for making the time to do this, you know, this jam cast, but more so, you know, thanks for everything you've done to contribute to the community, whether it's on the local Colorado scene to, you know, chicken as, a, as an entire sport. You know, we were all a part of it since it's, uh, you know, infancy to its developmental stages to where it's at right now. And, uh, you know, I really, really thank you for everything you've done, man. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. And likewise to you, thanks for doing stuff like this and continuing to be an innovator and continuing to drive the sport forward in places that you know that growth needs to happen. Um, so all of us thank you. So Thanks, brother. Yeah, this I, is great. I it was great being that. on. I appreciate it. Hell yeah, man. Yo, guys, with that being said, please be sure to hit that like button, comment, and subscribe for brand episodes each and every week. Join us every Monday for Jam Breakdowns and every Friday for brand new Jamcast, interviewing influential members of the movement community like Mr. Nick Vale himself. So with that being said, guys, I got to give one more very special shout out. Thanks for coming through, Nick. I really appreciate the time, homie. Thank you. Have a good day, man. You too, man. And with that being said, guys, as always, coming at you, coming through, I'm your host, Travis Wong. Thanks for joining us here on another Jamcast. Until next time, we'll see you all soon. Peace.